candidates tournament is taking place in Yekaterinburg in Russia. Eight players battling it out to see who will become the challenger to face Magnus Carlsen for the world title. Going into round six, there was a sole leader, Jan Nepomnishi from Russia. In round six, he faced the Chinese superstar Ding Liren, who started the tournament very poorly with two losses, but he's come back. So this was a big test for the Russian leader of the tournament. Now, this game was quite um, a heavy strategic battle, but there are a couple of absolutely incredible tactical moments. Uh, just stick around for them because they really are extraordinary. So this line that they're playing has been quite popular with the, the top players over the last few years. So it's one of these typical Spanish positions where white sets up not with c3 and d4, but goes for a solid pawn chain. Um, so in this way, uh, Nepo basically avoids Ding's favorite martial uh, attack. Um, I mean, at this moment, it looks as though white shouldn't have any claim for the advantage at all, considering that you know, black has managed to, you know, organize his pieces so well here. Um, but, well, there's, there's a lot going on. Queen, D, Queen d7 has been played by Ding before. So the game continued like this. So this is one of the motifs in this game that white is somehow trying to prove that this bishop is not a great piece. And bishop d8 has been played here, um, but Ding preferred to get his queenside counterplay going straight away. Now, it is possible to take that bishop, but actually it's very hard for white to, to prove a, a, a kind of successful kingside attack there. Ding has had this exact position on two previous occasions. He lost against Carlsen, but actually his position was okay in 2017. He also had it against uh, Maxime Vachy-Legrave in London in 2019, in, um, at the end of 2019, December. And, well, drew very comfortably, actually, he even had the better of it. Um, and in both those games, uh, Carlsen and Vachy Legrave played c4. Um, Nepo played rook b2, a new move. Well, obviously, this avoids the pin on the a file. And there could be a little bit of pressure on the b5 pawn. So Ding exchanged pawns and then dropped the bishop back to d8, which looks a bit passive, but, well, it tucks the bishop out of trouble. And let's see, c4. Okay, so the, the, the queenside initiative starts. And here Ding plays, I think, quite a risky move, at least from a positional point of view. I don't see anything wrong with putting the knight back on e7. Um, and playing c6 and just exchanging off that knight or and, and, and maybe that bishop will come out to b6. But knight d4, well, he also wants to get in c6 and I think it's, it's an okay move but it kind of raises the stakes because with this pawn, like, like a dead point in the middle of the board, you can see that that potentially limits the bishop's mobility. Now, White's problem is that this knight actually, once it's driven from d5, will actually struggle to find a good square. So it's like a, a battle of the minor pieces which minor piece can be the most useful or the most useless, I don't know. Queen c2. And now, well, c6, and then let's just shuffle the queen across to support this pawn. This should be okay for black.
But Ding played rookie eight. Well, in some ways, this is a more active move. Um, as we're about to see, this is a, it's a more dynamic way of playing, certainly. Let's have a look. So g3, fine. You need to give the king a little bit of room, and that can support the knight as well. So an exchange on c4 and c6, the knight's driven from d5. And the bishop hops out to drive away the knight, which comes back to e2. Um, but what Ding has done here is provoke a little bit of a crisis, because you can see that now this pawn on d4 is actually vulnerable. And the only way out of that is by playing d5 and opening things up. So this is why he played rook e8. Ding is actually playing in a really dynamic way. So this forces an exchange on d5. Now, queen takes d4, of course, is impossible because of the skewer, bishop f6. So the queen drops to b3. So now we've got, uh, well, uh, uh, imbalance in the position. So the knight and bishop for a start, but also obviously the pawn structure. So these pawns look a little bit strange, but they do control some important squares. This rook looks pretty good on the E file. This rook also has possibilities on the A file. But the big problem for black is that pawn on B4. How far is that going to go? So black really needs to find counterplay here. And he does have active pieces. So there's a couple of ways. Rook A6 is pretty interesting. But Ding went for H5, which is a very tempting move. And it, it just seems very natural to advance the pawn to h3. Of course, if it were possible, then white would like to block the pawn on h5 by playing h4. But this doesn't work, of course, for tactical reasons, because that can simply be taken. And black's queen is ready to come in to the king side. If that bishop is taken, then black is actually winning after this. And a check, and you could even pick up that pawn and then pick up the rook, which is obviously fine. Well, more, more than fine for black, very, very good for black. So h5, basically this one is about to embed itself on h3. This is a strong theme at the moment in the tournament, the advance of the h-pawn. Uh, and before everyone says the influence of alpha zero, do you know what? People were advancing rook's pawns a long time before alpha zero. Okay, so here we go, b5. Now, it's getting very, very sharp because this pawn on b5, supported by the, head, the, the major pieces, is obviously a long-term threat. So now the h-pawn advances. Uh, re remember, if knight takes pawn, then that pin is very uncomfortable for white. Uh, and and that's, that applies over the next few moves as well. So b6 by Nepo. And he said oh, after the game, it's already no fun for black, but it's not so clear, actually. Yes, that pawn is obviously incredibly powerful. But watch what goes on on the king side, h3. So it just needs the queen to move into those light squares and it could be game over. So basically the stakes are raised now. This is an excellent move, king h1. And the point is that in many variations, that knight, which has struggled to find a good square, actually finds a really good square on g1 because it protects the f3 square or covers the f3 square, preventing a queen invasion and also can threaten the h3 pawn, which, you know, in end games could just simply win the game. Okay, but it's still not clear this position. Rook b8 by Ding. Rook b1 from Nepo. So he's just piling up here and wants to push on. Bishop d8, threatening that pawn. And here, 
Well, again, you know, this is one of those situations that during a game is very hard to determine, but b7 should probably be played here. Um, Nepo was concerned that there might be some kind of exchange of two rooks for the queen, but it should be better for white. But if you play queen b5, which looks very natural, the end game, as I said, is excellent for white. And here, Ding played the very natural queen g4, which turns out is a big mistake. And here is the first of these situations where there is an extraordinary tactic in the position. Now, I'm not showing this to point out where one of the players made a mistake, bleh, should have spotted it. This is really understandable. Um, Let's have a look at this. I'm showing this because it's, it's quite extraordinary and it's really beautiful. Queen f5 is actually a stronger move. So let's have a look. Um, so first things first. Bishop takes pawn is threatened. But of course, the big threat is to play queen f3 check and deliver checkmate. So uh, white plays, therefore, knight takes d4 attacking the queen, covering the f3 square, and also the f2 pawn is protected. So that's a logical move. Queen g4, attacking the knight on d4. So queen takes d5, nice move. A secure move, defending the knight, but also that queen covers that diagonal. And at that point, you'd think, OK, white can, can breathe again. Still not so clear. Bishop f6, attacking the knight and pinning. So the rook moves up. Still looks like white has everything under control. At this moment, white is two pawns up, and that should be enough to win. But here is the outrageous tactic. OK, maybe maybe it's time for a slurp of tea and for you to have a little think. Can you spot how black should play in this position? It is really extraordinary. So you have a little think. I'll have a little slurp of tea from my beautiful Brentford mug, Brentford Football Club, doing well in the championship. Here we go, black to play and do something outrageous. Bishop takes knight, so far so good. Queen takes, queen f3 and mate, so therefore rook takes. Still absolutely fine for white, but no. Here we go. The queen is attacked, do we mind? No, rook takes pawn on b6. This is incredible. Now, just watch black's major pieces. The queen is on prees. This rook is on prees. This rook is on prees, and yet this is actually working for black. It is outrageous, absolutely outrageous. So let, let's deal with the four suit moves. Well, uh, rook takes queen, then there's rook takes rook and checkmate on the back rank, so that pawn comes good. We've got rook takes rook and queen d1 and checkmate. Okay, well let's let's take the rook with check. That can't be a bad start. Okay, queen takes rook check. And now incredibly there's there's no decent way to consolidate. So this is still threatened. So therefore, well let's move the rook across. And now queen takes rook. And in this position, well white is a pawn up. But actually Black should hold this because that pawn is so annoying and black is very well coordinated, can hit that pawn. It's enough compensation, should be a draw. Okay, let's come back to this position after the outrageous rook takes b6. So let's, let's try rook f1. And here, in spite of the fact that this queen is on prees, this rook is on prees, in fact, black saves himself with queen c8. And once again, black has sufficient compensation here. That 
H3 pawn is really annoying and should be good enough to hold. So there we go. Queen f5 is actually stronger than the game continuation, but honestly, you're never going to spot that in the game. So queen g4 played. And here, actually, the best for white is to play queen e8 check. And this should be winning. Should be winning for white. But instead, queen takes d5, which also looks so natural. Take a pawn, cover this diagonal. But watch what happens. Rook a5. And here, actually, well, f3 should be uh, good for white. But queen c6, six, really natural move. Looks like white has everything under control. And again, it's time for you to see if you can spot the tactic. I mean, this is, again, incredible. Here, Ding played rook c5, which wasn't good enough. He could have played rook takes b6. Rook takes rook. Queen takes knight. Still looks like white has everything under control here. So black threatens to take the rook. So let's <clears throat> let's play rook b8. And now, here's the outrageous move. White is already a rook for bishop up. And black plays rook e5. Well, as Nepo said after the game, this is very hard to spot. If you see rook e5, you should be disqualified. Yeah, anyone playing this during a real game would simply be you know, accused of using your computer. <laughs> it's incredible. So in this position, white is a whole rook up and yet cannot, um, cannot win this game. So threat, queen here check and mate. So the rook shuffles across to g1. Queen takes f2, threat, for example, rook e1, or yeah, maybe even rook e2, but rook e1 rook e will do the job. And here, well, queen a8, let's, let's just show this. In fact, this does lose. Queen check and f6, and no more decent checks. That's winning for black. White can actually draw by doing this check. And this check wins the pawn on h3, and actually that is good enough to draw after this. The king sort of runs away, but, well, queen f4 is good enough to draw. Okay, so again, this is an outrageous tactic and impossible to see during a game, but very beautiful. Instead, Dink played rook c5. And now Nepo played knight g1, and this basically consolidates the position um, because the knight covers the f3 square. h3 is under fire. White, you know, can some, sometimes simply threaten to exchange queens, and he'll still have the beautiful pass pawn on b6 as well as threatening that pawn on h3. Um, Ding tried rook takes pawn, giving up a piece, but this time it's in vain. Looks scary. Queen f3, mate threatened, but Nepo exchanged queens, and basically that was that. It takes a couple of moves for white to untangle, but that was actually the final move of the game, f3. Ding resigned in this position. <clears throat> Let's just see why. Um, well, if rook takes pawn, then knight takes h3, and you can't even take this because of the check. And if king h6, this forces black to take on d3 because rook takes d4 is threatened. We take on h3. Yes, black can take that pawn, but actually now white frees the king. Now we just have to reposition the knight. We'll put it on f3 because that will cover the king and it'll start to, to chase down that pawn. Basically, black cannot hold that d pawn. Um, well, after a careful rook d5, stopping black's king advancing, white will come around with the king, 
take the D pawn and well, then that's really easy. You can slowly creep forward with your rook and knight and win the game. So, um, pretty incredible. Nepo increases his lead. Um, he said after the game, he said, I'm, I'm just trying to make less mistakes than usual. Fewer mistakes. He said, he also said, I'm definitely not feeling not okay. Uh, he said he wanted to make a quick draw in the game because he, he looks like he caught a cold. We hope it's just a cold. He said, I was never against it until I got this position. You know, his preparation worked well. Um, but he said, you know, in general, the whole atmosphere doesn't help you to feel healthy, but he's had a couple of tests and both were negative. So fingers crossed, Nepo is okay. Um, but yeah, he after the game, he, he really, um, he looked pretty drained. And I'm sure he's glad that there is a rest day um, tomorrow, Tuesday. So as I said, he increases his lead after that. He's on four and a half out of six. Caruana failed to win. He only drew against Grishuk. So uh, Nepo out in the lead. I'll be discussing the candidates more in my hangout tomorrow. So Tuesday evening, that's uh, 1900 hours UK time. Uh, you'll find the link in the description. So do join me. We'll have a chat about the candidates. I'll show you some games, some puzzles. And uh, yeah, we'll shoot the breeze, basically. Thanks for watching. See you.